Firstly, I want to share a photograph of uh, myself and my father and our dog Bungie. And I'm about, um, I think I'm about two years old, three years old here in this photo. The reason I wanted to share that is because um, this was m very much um, encapsulates the first five, six years of my childhood. Um, I grew up with my Aboriginal father, um, Wayne, Kwanamooka man. And um, he was a young man, 20 years old, um, as a father in the 80s. And um, back in those days, I spent a lot of time with him, um, traveling around, looking for work. Um, you know, we'd just camp up wherever we could and he'd get laboring jobs. And um, wherever we camped up was always with other blackfellas. So um, that's really important to kind of discuss because later on in my life, um, when I went to art school, I started thinking about challenging all of these sorts of systems that we're all kind of um, prescribed once we go into the education system. And so this time in my life was very informative. I, from a very young age, knew I was always traveling and visiting other mobs country and um, that we were visitors and that there's, you know, ways in relating to places that um, I guess grand narrative or Ast general Australians don't really know about um, until they meet Aboriginal people. So um, yeah, I'm really grateful and proud of my father because that would have been really difficult. And it's also a story that we don't hear much about um, when we think about black and white relations in Australia. We don't hear about young Aboriginal fathers independently raising children. Um, and so I am one of those people. In saying that, it was pretty wild, it wasn't easy. And um, yeah, we grew up what, rough and pretty poor. Um, and my idea of um, Aboriginal art was also in, um, you know, the same kind of way that I guess uh, prescribed notions of Aboriginal art, like dot painting. So when I was a teenager, I used to paint on um, cornflake boxes, glass jars, like whatever was around. Like um, it kind of, I really enjoyed painting. Um, and dad was pretty encouraging of that. And so when I was about 17, I was living um, on the Gold Coast, which is south of my country, um, on Yugambe country. And um, I thought I was really deadly because I started a business, so I got an ABN and I was like going to make Aboriginal art and be an Aboriginal artist. Um, and so these are the kinds of works that I would make. I'd do your sort of tourist art. Um, and that was really good for me. I was making really good money. Um, and I never questioned anything until one day um, the guy I was selling my work to was trying to haggle and, and I was like, well, how much did you get for this, that cobble painting, snake painting? Because this is our totem here, cobble, the carpet snake. And it was sentimental to me. It was a meaningful painting. Um, and yeah, he uh, looked very guilty. And I asked the staff member and she told me, look, don't tell my boss, but we got 650 for that. And I sold it to him for $40. Um, and so I grabbed my Aboriginal art and I left that uh, <laughs> Uh, store and I drove home and I was crying and uh, when I got home I rang my nana and uh, she told me Megan you don't need to be painting dot paintings to be Aboriginal you know you're just Aboriginal like just do art you've always loved it just do it so um, that was like you know really a critical turning point in my life as um, a young Aboriginal woman, um, going through a lot of stuff like, um, but art being that kind of anchor in my life and um, source of stability and um, income as well. So um, I went to university and I studied at, uh, I studied contemporary Australian Aboriginal art or indigenous art actually is the word it's called in the university. And that was massive for me. I learnt about Gordon Bennett, I learnt about Fiona Foley, I learnt about um, contemporary Aboriginal artists that were telling stories in ways that were completely outside the prescribed 
format of dot painting, the kind of, you know, Geoffrey Barden went out to the desert and he, he asked those people to take their ceremonial practices from the land and from the body onto a physical object. You know, like I was then in an environment where we didn't have to do that, you know, that wasn't the expectation. And I was with Aboriginal people. So I started to think about ways about talking about my place, my country, about time, um, concepts of ownership, and um, yeah, challenging uh, non-Aboriginal people, I guess, about um, how to see my country in the way that we do. And uh, so this is the first iteration of that, I guess. This is our country, Kwanamooka, Moreton Bay. Um, I wanted to decolonise the environment through bringing in our language and challenging people's ideas of place. Um, and yeah, I, d I do that through the use of language and also generating um, a five metre sea level rise over the landscape because that connects the stories that we have about the time when the sea rose in our country. Um, I've always tried to challenge myself a lot and challenge um, the, all the stuff that I learned at school because I know it's not right. This work was a sound and projection work that was in Fort Lytton on the Brisbane River. And for this work, I decided to ask my cousins to uh, sing a war chant. And they did that and I recorded it. And then this was like an installation where everybody was inside a war fort. I don't know if you know what that feels like, but you're very much inside a space that's um, where you can't really see outside where you want to see. If you want to see outside, you have to go into spaces like this, which is inside a bunker, down these cor concrete corridors, and then look out um, in the way that the military did, like through a sniper range. So in this particular work, you heard the sounds of my cousins singing a war song, and then you saw the projection of the word Turrbal, which connects to the country on the other side of that river. So that was pretty radical for me, but it felt really right. Um, and I got quite a bit of reassurance actually, because I was kind of big nating myself and um, said to the curator, I should be in that show, not knowing anything about what the arts is like and how like hierarchical it is and all that kind of stuff. But I. I had been to this war fort and I had already th had these thoughts and so he laughed and he said, all right then, send me a proposal. And so I did and um, he said, it's great. And it was a really good um, work for me. Um, so just continuing on with the place name projections or toponyms, um, as white people like to call them. I wanna go like from the map, from the 2D aerial safe space of a, of a military map or a geological map um, and then bring it into the environment because, you know, like we are really struggling in lots of ways to, um, well, you know, these works are sort of also 10, 15 years in the making and I'm, I'm happy to say that I do feel things are changing now that I'm 36 and not 25, like I have witnessed quite a bit of change, but, um, you know, a lot of things that motivated me to make this work is challenging these ideas that I'm talking to you about. So I wanted to go beyond uh, the two-dimensional space or flat space of a map, but then also into the physical environment, but in, not in a romantic way. Like, we all kind of like know that the desert belongs to Aborigines, you know? But do we think about urban spaces as Aboriginal spaces, you know? And that for me is really important. And and do we understand then also that the, the physical resources extracted from country um, that have, you know, significant economic worth and then distribution of that economics um, into our everyday lives? Like, do we recognise that? So, you know, for me, that's the motivation when I project um, Boykin Ball, which is an island on the Gold Coast, on Yugambeh country again. I just wanted to put it on a pile of rocks because it's like, you know, you might have significantly altered the landscape, but it's still Aboriginal land. So that's sort of 
you know, make him work about that. Um, I can't believe that's less than two minutes. Um, <laughs> since I've been down here, um, like I said, a visitor um, on the lands of the Kulin Nation, um, I've been thinking also about this same kind of stuff and thinking about how there isn't really acknowledgement or inclusion of um, Victorian Aboriginal people um, in the distribution of wealth generated by the British Empire, um, you know, which was the largest empire in the world during, particularly during the 1830s and 50s, right, like that time period is really critical. Um, to sort of acknowledge that as a quantum walker person, I made these two works over geological maps of Jajawaran country and Wadawaran country. Um, and that's where the main gold rush and wealth extraction to build this empire came from. Um, I painted the gold back into the landscape and I also um, stained it with rum and tea, which was the British form of currency to pay Aboriginal people for any of their work, whether it be, um, you know, access to places and trickery that the British did. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to um, acknowledge that I recognise that down here and that it's a very critical time um, uh, in the chapter of Victoria. It's interesting working over geological maps as opposed to military maps. Military maps were my first go-to um, point because I guess of the military occupation of our country and how that all started in the first place. That's something that I was very mindful of. But, you know, that's, that's um, double-edged as well because uh, a lot of men in my family served in World War I and II and that was, um, that's been an important story in our family as well. Um, so this work was my first big major commission in a major institution in uh, Brisbane at Quagoma for a show curated by Bruce McLean called My Country, I Still Call Australia Home. And in this commission, um, they wanted me to make this map that, that was 10 metres long and seven metres high. And that was really challenging for me, but um, also a major um, game changer or a major change in my practice because before that I always made quite small works and um, I kind of made maps that we could hold in our hands or be quite close to um, and I don't I hadn't really thought of that that was just my sort of instinctual relationship to maps um, and it was really deadly because Bruce challenged me and then when I saw it and then saw people's response to it um, it was really amazing to see our language on an institution um, in this scale. It was incredible. And our um, dancers came over and danced in front of it and it was, just, it was just really beautiful to see. It led to, I guess, a lot of things that I do in my work now. Like I now have the confidence to work on much greater scales and work um, in the public um, domain with public art and transforming maps into the physical environment through public art as well. The next slide um, that'll come up soon, you might be familiar with it. It's um, on the Australian Catholic University building um, on Vi Victoria Parade and Brunswick Street. Um, and there's a bit of a funny story with that work um, because I was really busy at the time and I also felt like it wasn't my place to be um, submitting a work. Um, I really do think that um, more Koori artists down here um, should be engaged in this context when it comes to um, telling stories about place. Um, so yeah, there it is. That's um, the, the building and the artwork. But when I was drawing it up, I decided to make it so huge and so ridiculous that none of those white men would pick 
um, this artwork because I just thought for sure they would not want to see Aboriginal language so massive on their building. Um, and this is just one side. This, this actually goes on four sides. Uh, oh no, three. But there's four major panels and um, all of them connecting to the language of the land here, um, which I worked with Vackle um, and got permission from Vackle to include that language over um, this country. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. They said, we love it. It looks like a brain and yeah, we love the language. It's really cool. Um, and I was just like, all right. Then I just had to get um, to work and figure out how to then do it within a very small budget. Um, luckily, um, I didn't have to make any long-term guarantees because I think at the time when the project was happening, um, I only had the responsibility of five years. So um, this building, I think, will probably come down next year, So, um, which is fortunate. Because sometimes as an artist, you've got specific limitations and you've got material restrictions that you have to work with and that's one of them. But I'm just happy that like so many Kuru Mob love that work and see themselves in it and that's the most important thing for me. I don't really, it's not about me. Um, these sorts of works are not really about me. Um, this work is about me though. Um, <laughs> this <laughs> work is called The Blacktism. And I don't know if you've seen it. It's a, a video work well, that I decided to make about um, Australia's obsession with authenticity and my identity and their uncomfortability with me saying, proudly saying that I'm Aboriginal and proudly connecting to my family and my country. Um, there's often... A, um, a lot of suspicion met when you say you're Aboriginal. It's like, well, but why don't you want to be white? Or, you know, you must be getting stuff then, you know? Like, because you look white, so you, why don't you want to be like us, you know? There's these sorts of things, these undercurrents that flow in Australia when you look like me, you know? And so this work, I decided to make a certificate video where I get black -tized, um, which means I get um, turned into an authentic Aborigine. Um, according to all of the cultural authorities that we um, meet in, on our daily basis, and those cultural authorities being um, uh, like a junkie bogan, um, a tradie, <laughs> Aussie babe, there's a hipster, um, there's a wasp, which is a white Anglo Protestant. Anglo something like that, there's, a, there's, an ar there's an archetype. I've researched archetypes. Um, and basically what happens is they anoint me in this sacred ceremony um, and I get turned into a real Aborigine, according to them. And so they paint me a nice colour brown that is recognisable and they give me a piece of paper and um, that's, you know, part of it. Um, yeah, and... So I'm always like thinking about these things and thinking about ways to challenge, um, yeah, prescribed notions of Aboriginality and who decides, like, and why is it that everybody else seems to have the power and we don't? Um, in this work, it's called Resistance, which is a bit of a play on words um, because they're protest signs, but it's resistance in the way that white people resist our autonomy and our sovereignty and um, telling stories the way we want to. So in this artwork, I've quoted um, lots of uh, cultural authorities like um, Delta Goodrum and um, politicians and you know leading figures in popular culture that know a lot about everybody else. Um, and I've written them in the Brady Bunch font to kind of connect with their position of privilege. So through that text, you know, making that connection. Um, but I've also interpreted my uh, um, kind of like the results of those sort of statements in the public space and how they then relate on impact on Aboriginal people and asylum seekers as well. Um, so that's what this work is about. Um, and that was in an exhibition at the Powerhouse in Brisbane with a collective that I belong to called Proper Now. 
um, which is an intergenerational radical art collective, mm. I guess you could call. <laughs> um, but, you know, I joined that collective when I was... Um, well, 2011, I can't do the maths, but, you know, I felt younger than I am now. And um, that was really amazing for me because it gave me the confidence and provided a safe space to talk about all the things that I'm talking to you about now. Um, before proper now, I was pretty nervous to be sharing such intimate things and motivations to why I make things. Um, again, this artwork is... Uh, challenging uh, <laughs> identity and um, you know who who gets to decide who's Aboriginal and what grounds it is and what those boundaries are I decided to really um, be a bit cheeky and make this artwork where anyone could become Aboriginal um, if they did a test and according to their test results they could then apply to be Aboriginal for the duration of um, the exhibition, which was a month. So um, it was a pretty exciting opportunity for non-Aboriginal people who wanted to become Aboriginal uh, for a month. And based on their knowledge, like you had to do 20 questions, and if you got 65%, then you were then eligible to uh, apply for membership. Membership did require that you pay a fee to an Aboriginal organisation, which was a donation. Once you provide a proof of that donation, uh, I would then do the paperwork and uh, send out the... Um, and, you know, like in this form also, there was very specific details that you had to disclose. And I actually um, got a lot of abusive messages from people who had applied and then been rejected <laughs> or, like, not... Um, you know, they really felt entitled and they were really curious to know what it was going to be like, but they didn't pass the test. But also... Part of the test was disclosing their income, where they lived, um, all of these sorts of details that we have to give constantly to the state to validate our existence. So I really wanted to like um, give that opportunity to non-Aboriginal people to see how it felt, um, but with a reward, you know. So um, <laughs> if you got more than 65%, you got um, your membership. If you got 85, then you got coloniser exemption like <laughs> certificate um, and your membership. Um, and if you got 90%, then you got a visa to my country <laughs> as well as the coloniser. And you, you would be, you know, received well um, on our country and uh, looked after. Anyway, so that's another work that I did. Now, this work um, is about economics as well and... Um, I guess erasure of our physical architecture um, on country. Um, at the moment, as you know, sister, we've got a lot of discussions constantly going on about the economic transition plan on our country post mining. And it's like pandemonium, like the world's going to end. And, you know, I, I asked my nana what she thought, and she said, Oh, come on. You know, we were here before the mine, we'll be here after the mine. It doesn't really matter. And I love my nana when she says things like that because it's just, it's very grounding. But this work was sparked by that current um, climate and our relationship with government and the pressure and the political structures that um, are imposed on us as um, Kwanamuka people. And I decided to look at um, structures that were mined before the sand mine, the mineral sands that um, are extracted from our country. And, you know, one of the first industries in Australia um, was the lime burning industry. And this industry relied on the desecration of Aboriginal shell piles, which they called middens, which means rubbish dump. But those Aboriginal shell piles were monumental in scale, enormous. The ones um, in Sydney, where the Sydney Opera House is today, was noted as 100 metres long and 15 metres high. Now, we, we look at that architecture there now and we think it's amazing. Well, imagine if there were shell piles that were 30,000 years old. Like, how would we feel about that? So I really wanted to make works that um, connected to that and um, I've started making middens myself through... Um, remaking um, hand cast shells with concrete 
um, which my dad loves because he's a concreter. Um, but then the other one just before was um, with beer cans as well to talk about cultural sites changing. This is a photo of when that work that when I first made it, I got invited to go to um, Jerusalem um, in the Middle East and um, have an exhibition uh, with Palestinian artists. And I decided to collect the earth um, with Palestinian brothers and sisters um, and put my shells in their soil as an act of solidarity to acknowledge that I understand the erasure that's happening there under a, um, a horrific regime. Um, so this is me, a photo of me um, sifting that sand. And one thing that really moved me was that, um, you know, and a lot of Palestinians have to go under the radar too, you know, over there. Um, when they came past this work and me, they didn't really talk to me, they just grabbed that earth and smelt it and said, this is the real Palestinian land. And they were very emotional about it and it really moved me. Um, so sometimes your work can take you places that you don't, you couldn't have dreamed of, you know? And sometimes like art is a really great way to connect with people um, and share a struggle and yeah, acknowledge and think about ways that we can look after each other. Um, so that's me there in Jerusalem. Um, continuing on talking about country and my country in, in new ways, different ways. Um, I want to talk about um, ocean acid acidification. This is a real problem. This is um, something that we're all contributing to, whether we like it or not. Um, and I wanted to make a work that kind of illustrates that or demonstrates, um, yeah, how ocean acidification is working. And maybe, you know, you've seen in lots of the works tonight, it's really, you know, I'm trying to make the invisible visible. And I think that this work is trying to do that as well. I made, um, the iceberg is made out of cabbage juice, red cabbage, you boil it. And the reason I used um, cabbage juice is because it's a um, natural pH indicator. It's a very sort of scientific approach. Um, so I just boiled the um, cabbages and then froze it in different layers in a big tub. Um, and I included shells, oyster shells um, with everyday household ob uh, items like bicarb soda, citric acid, lemon juice, things like that. Put them in the oyster shell and then put, froze them in the berg. And when they fall out, they change colour and that's what gives the reading, the, the, the pH reading to talk about acidification. Um, all calcifying creatures are vulnerable to um, ocean acidification. So I'm really kind of mad about this now and like that came sort of from the midden work as well and like just um, thinking about ways to um, talk about that and my responsibility as a quantum walker person and um, what I can do and what art can do to um, you know yeah bring bring that conversation into not just a, um, make it an aboriginal responsibility so far in my conversations to the public, whenever I get these sorts of opportunities to talk about it, um, I've been like um, saying, well, I want to rebuild oyster reefs. We can do it. We can do it through art. Um, and we have to do it through art because like, we have restrictions with fisheries that don't want us to um, just simply rebuild the environment. There has to be a commercial outcome. Like, the government doesn't really support us um, when we um, wish to just rebuild our country. Um, so, but I think that art is a really good strategy. Um, and then afterwards, you know, I'll get really nice white fellows going, oh, have you heard of that crowdfunding? Have you heard of this? Have you heard of that? I'm like, yeah, I have heard of that. But I think this is something that we should all do together um, because we're all kind of, um, yeah, we can all be responsible for it and we can all take pride in um, the success of it too if, if this is what 
you know, we know best what our country needs and uh, if we tell you what our country needs then we can do that together and there's, you know, we're only 3% of the population, we actually need help. So, um, it, you know, that's, that's sort of like where the midden has taken me now. Um, this is 12,000 shells I made for um, an exhibition at the Art Gallery of New South Wales and this for me um, was my way of acknowledging that Gadigal midden that I talked about earlier. Um, to kind of bring it into a scale that we kind of, yeah, we might not see in our lifetime. So, um, but we might, our grandchildren might if we rebuild the reefs. I'll leave it there. Thank Thanks. you very much.